Section 1 of A Prince of Swindlers by Guy Boothby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. A Prince of Swindlers by Guy Boothby. Chapter 1. A Criminal in Disguise. After no small amount of deliberation, I have come to the conclusion that it is only fit and proper I should set myself right with the world in the matter of the now famous 1800 and blank swindles. For though I have never been openly accused of complicity in those miserable affairs, yet I cannot rid myself of the remembrance that it was I who introduced the man who perpetrated them to London society, and that in more than one instance I acted, innocently enough, heaven knows, as his deus ex machina, in bringing about the very results he was so anxious to achieve. I will first allude in a few words to the year in which the crimes took place, and then proceed to describe the events that led to my receiving the confession which has so strangely and unexpectedly come into my hands. Whatever else may be said on the subject, one thing at least is certain. It will be many years before London forgets that season of festivity. The joyous occasion which made half the sovereigns of Europe our guests for weeks on end kept foreign princes among us until their faces became as familiar to us as those of our own aristocracy, rendered the houses in our fashionable quarters unobtainable for love or money, filled our hotels to repletion, and produced daily pageants the like of which few of us have ever seen or imagined, can hardly fail to go down to posterity as one of the most notable in English history. Small wonder, therefore, that the wealth, then located in our great metropolis, should have attracted swindlers from all parts of the globe. That it should have fallen to the lot of one who has always prided himself on steering clear of undesirable acquaintances, to introduce to his friends one of the most notorious adventurers our capital has ever seen, seems like the irony of fate. Perhaps, however, if I begin by showing how cleverly our meeting was contrived, those who would otherwise feel inclined to censure me will pause before passing judgment, and will ask themselves whether they would not have walked into the snare as unsuspectedly as I did. It was during the last year of my term of office as Viceroy, and while I was paying a visit to the Governor of Bombay, that I decided upon making a tour of the northern provinces, beginning with Peshawar, and winding up with the Maharaja of Malarkadir. As the latter potentate is so well known, I need not describe him. His forcible personality, his enlightened rule, and the progress his state has made within the last ten years are well known to every student of the history of our magnificent Indian Empire. My stay with him was a pleasant finish to an otherwise monotonous business, for his hospitality has a worldwide reputation. When I arrived, he placed his palace, his servants, and his stables at my disposal to use just as I pleased. My time was practically my own. I could be as solitary as a hermit if I so desired. On the other hand, I had but to give the order, and five hundred men would cater for my amusement. It seems, therefore, the more unfortunate that to this pleasant arrangement I should have to contribute the calamities which it is the purpose of this series of stories to narrate. On the third morning of my stay, I woke early. When I had examined my watch, I discovered that it wanted an hour of daylight, and, not feeling inclined to go to sleep again, I wondered how I should employ my time until my servant should bring me my chota hazri, or early breakfast. On proceeding to my window, I found a perfect morning, the stars still shining, though in the east they were paling before the approach of dawn. It was difficult to realise that in a few hours the earth, which now looked so cool and wholesome, would be lying burnt up and quivering beneath the blazing Indian sun. I stood and watched the picture presented to me for some minutes, until an overwhelming desire came over me to order a horse and go for a long ride before the sun should make his appearance above the jungle trees. The temptation was more than I could resist, so I crossed the room and, opening the door, woke my servant, who was sleeping in the antechamber. Having bidden him find a groom and have a horse saddled for me, without rousing the household, I returned and commenced my toilet. Then, descending by a private staircase to the great courtyard, I mounted the animal I found awaiting me there, and set off. 
Leaving the city behind me, I made my way over the new bridge with which His Highness has spanned the river, and crossing the plain headed towards the jungle that rises like a green wall upon the other side. My horse was a whaler of exceptional excellence, as every one who knows the Maharaja's stable will readily understand, and I was just in the humour for a ride. But the coolness was not destined to last long, for by the time I had left the second village behind me, the stars had given place to the faint grey light of dawn. A soft breeze stirred the palms and rustled the long grass, but its freshness was deceptive. The sun would be up almost before I could look round, and then nothing could save us from a scorching day. After I had been riding for nearly an hour, it struck me that, if I wished to be back in time for breakfast, I had better think of returning. At the time I was standing in the centre of a small plain, surrounded by jungle. Behind me was the path I had followed to reach the place, in front and to the right and left, others leading whither I could not tell. Having no desire to return by the road I had come, I touched up my horse and cantered off in an easterly direction, feeling certain that even if I had to make a divergence, I should reach the city without very much trouble. By the time I had put three miles or so behind me, the heat had become stifling, the path being completely shut in on either side by the densest jungle I have ever known. For all I could see to the contrary, I might have been a hundred miles from any habitation. Imagine my astonishment, therefore, when, on turning a corner of the track, I suddenly left the jungle behind me, and found myself standing on the top of a stupendous cliff, looking down upon a lake of blue water. In the centre of this lake was an island, and on the island a house. At the distance I was from it, the latter appeared to be built of white marble, as indeed I afterward found to be the case. Anything, however, more lovely than the effect produced by the blue water, the white building, and the jungle-clad hills upon the other side, can scarcely be imagined. I stood and gazed at it in delighted amazement. Of all the beautiful places I had hitherto seen in India, this, I could honestly say, was entitled to rank first. But how it was to benefit me in my present situation, I could not for the life of me understand. Ten minutes later I had discovered a guide, and also a path down the cliff to the shore, where, I was assured, a boat and a man could be obtained to transport me back to the palace. I therefore bade my informant precede me, and after some minutes' anxious scrambling, my horse and I reached the water's edge. Once there, the boatman was soon brought to light, and when I had resigned my horse to the care of my guide, I was rowed across to the mysterious residence in question. On reaching it, we drew up at some steps, leading to a broad stone esplanade, which, I could see, encircled the entire place. Out of a grove of trees rose the building itself, a confused jumble of eastern architecture, crowned with many towers. With the exception of the vegetation and the blue sky, everything was of a dazzling white, against which the dark green of palms contrasted with admirable effect. Springing from the boat, I made my way up the steps, imbued with much the same feeling of curiosity as the happy prince, so familiar to us in our nursery days, must have experienced when he found the enchanted castle in the forest. As I reached the top, to my unqualified astonishment, an English man-servant appeared through a gateway and bowed before me. Breakfast is served, he said, and my master bids me say that he waits to receive your lordship. Though I thought he must be making a mistake, I said nothing but followed him along a terrace through a magnificent gateway, on the top of which a peacock was preening himself in the sunlight, through court after court, all built of the same white marble, through a garden in which a fountain was playing to the rustling accompaniment of, of pipal and pomegranate leaves, to finally enter the veranda of the main building itself. Drawing aside the curtain which covered the finely carved doorway, the servant invited me to enter, and as I did so, announced, His Excellency the Viceroy. The change from the vivid whiteness of the marble outside to the cool semi-European room in which I now found myself, was almost disconcerting in its abruptness. Indeed, I had scarcely time to recover my presence of mind before I became aware that my host was standing before me. Another surprise was in store for me. I had expected to find a native, instead of which he proved to be an Englishman. "'I am more indebted than I can say to Your Excellency for the honour of this visit,' he began, as he extended his hand. 
I can only wish I were better prepared for it. You must not say that, I answered. It is I who should apologize. I fear I am an intruder. But to tell you the truth, I had lost my way, and it is only by chance that I am here at all. I was foolish to venture out without a guide, and have none to blame for what has occurred but myself. In this case, I must thank the fates for their kindness to me, returned my host. But don't let me keep you standing. You must be both tired and hungry after your long ride, and breakfast, as you see, is upon the table. Shall we show ourselves sufficiently blind to the conventionalities to sit down to it without further preliminaries? Upon my assenting, he struck a small gong at his side, and servants, acting under the instructions of the white man who had conducted me to his master's presence, instantly appeared in answer to it. We took our places at the table, and the meal immediately commenced. While it was in progress, I was permitted an excellent opportunity of studying my host, who sat opposite me, with such light as penetrated the Jehill mills, falling directly upon his face. I doubt, however, vividly as my memory recalls the scene, whether I can give you an adequate description of the man who has since come to be a sort of nightmare to me. In height he could not have been more than five feet two. His shoulders were broad, and would have been evidence of considerable strength, but for one malformation, which completely spoilt his whole appearance. The poor fellow suffered from curvature of the spine, of the worst sort, and the large hump between his shoulders produced a most extraordinary effect. But it is when I endeavour to describe his face that I find myself confronted with the most serious difficulty. How to make you realise it, I hardly know. To begin with, I do not think I should be overstepping the mark were I to say that it was one of the most beautiful countenances I have ever seen in my fellow men. Its contour was as perfect as that of the bust of the Greek god Hermes, to whom, all things considered, it is only fit and proper he should bear some resemblance. The forehead was broad and surmounted with a wealth of dark hair, in colour almost black. His eyes were large and dreamy, the brows almost pencilled in their delicacy. The nose, the most prominent feature of his face, reminded me more of that of the great Napoleon than any other I can recall. His mouth was small but firm, his ears as tiny as those of an English beauty, and set in closer to his head than is usual with those organs. But it was his chin that fascinated me most. It was plainly that of a man accustomed to command, that of a man of iron will, whom no amount of opposition would deter from his purpose. His hands were small and delicate, and his fingers taper, plainly those of the artist, either a painter or a musician. Altogether he presented a unique appearance, and one that once seen would not be easily forgotten. During the meal I congratulated him upon the possession of such a beautiful residence, the like of which I had never seen before. Unfortunately, he answered, the place does not belong to me but is the property of our mutual host, the Maharaja. His Highness, knowing that I am a scholar and a recluse, is kind enough to permit me the use of this portion of the palace, and the value of such a privilege I must leave you to imagine. You are a student, then, I said, as I began to understand matters a little more clearly. In a perfunctory sort of way, he replied, that is to say, I have acquired sufficient knowledge to be aware of my own ignorance. I ventured to inquire the subject in which he took most interest. It proved to be China and the native art of India, and on these two topics we conversed for upwards of half an hour. It was evident that he was a consummate master of his subject. This I could the more readily understand when, our meal being finished, he led me into the adjoining room, in which stood the cabinets containing his treasures. Such a collection I had never seen before. Its size and completeness amazed me. "'But surely you have not brought all these specimens together yourself?' I asked in astonishment. "'With a few exceptions,' he answered. "'You see, it has been the hobby of my life, "'and it is to the fact that I am now engaged upon a book upon the subject, "'which I hope to have published in England next year, "'that you may attribute my playing the hermit here.' "'You intend, then, to visit England?' "'If my book is finished in time,' he answered, I shall be in London at the end of April, or the commencement of May. Who would not wish to be in the chief city of Her Majesty's dominions upon such a joyous and auspicious occasion? 
As he said this, he took down a small vase from a shelf, and, as if to change the subject, described its history and its beauties to me. A stranger picture than he presented at that moment it would be difficult to imagine. His long fingers held his treasure as carefully as if it were an invaluable jewel. His eyes glistened with the fire of the true collector, who is born but never made, and when he came to that part of his narrative which described the long hunt for, and the eventual purchase of, the ornament in question, his voice fairly shook with excitement. I was more interested than at any other time I should have thought possible, and it was then that I committed the most foolish action of my life. Quite carried away by his charm, I said, I hope when you do come to London, you will permit me to be of any service I can to you. I thank you, he answered gravely. Our lordship is very kind, and if the occasion arises, as I hope it will, I shall most certainly avail myself of your offer. We shall be very pleased to see you, I replied. And now, if you will not consider me inquisitive, may I ask if you live in this great place alone? With the exception of my servants, I have no companions. Really? You must surely find it very lonely. I do, and it is that very solitude which endears it to me. When his highness so kindly offered me the place for a residence, I inquired if I should have much company. He replied that I might remain here twenty years, and never see a soul unless I chose to do so. On hearing that, I accepted his offer with alacrity. Then you prefer the life of a hermit to mixing with your fellow men? I do, but next year I shall put off my monastic habits for a few months, and mix with my fellow men, as you call them, in London. You will find hearty welcome, I am sure. It is very kind of you to say so. I hope I shall. But I am forgetting the rules of hospitality. You are a great smoker, I have heard. Let me offer you a cigar. As he spoke, he took a small silver whistle from his pocket and blew a peculiar note upon it. A moment later, the same English servant, who had conducted me to his presence, entered carrying a number of cigar boxes upon a tray. I chose one, and as I did so, glanced at the man. In outward appearance, he was exactly what a body servant should be, of medium height, scrupulously neat, clean-shaven, and with a face as devoid of expression as a blank wall. When he had left the room again, my host immediately turned to me. Now, he said, as you have seen my collection, will you like to explore the palace? To this proposition I gladly assented, and we set off together. An hour later, satiated with the beauty of what I had seen, and feeling as if I had known the man beside me all my life, I bade him good-bye upon the steps, and prepared to return to the spot where my horse was waiting for me. One of my servants will accompany you, he said, and will conduct you to the city. I am greatly indebted to you, I answered. Should I not see you before, I hope you will not forget your promise to call upon me, either in Calcutta before we leave, or in London next year. He smiled in a peculiar way. You must not think me so blind to my own interests as to forget your kind offer, he replied. It is just possible, however, that I may be in Calcutta before you leave. I shall hope to see you then, I said, and having shaken him by the hand, stepped into the boat which was waiting to convey me across. Within an hour I was back once more to the palace, much to the satisfaction of the Maharaja and my staff, to whom my absence had been the cause of considerable anxiety. It was not until the evening that I found a convenient opportunity, and was able to question His Highness about his strange protégé. He quickly told me all there was to know about him. His name, it appeared, was Simon Carne. He was an Englishman and had been a great traveller. On a certain memorable occasion he had saved His Highness's life at the risk of his own, and ever since that time a close intimacy had existed between them. For upwards of three years the man in question had occupied a wing of the island palace, going away for months at a time, presumably in search of specimens for his collection, and returning when he became tired of the world. To the best of His Highness's belief, he was exceedingly wealthy, but on this subject little was known. Such was all I could learn about the mysterious individual I had met earlier in the day. Much as I wanted to do so, I was unable to pay another visit to the palace on the lake. 
Owing to pressing business, I was compelled to return to Calcutta as quickly as possible. For this reason, it was nearly eight months before I saw or heard anything of Simon Carne again. When I did meet him, we were in the midst of our preparations for returning to England. I had been for a ride, I remember, and was in the act of dismounting from my horse, when an individual came down the steps and strolled towards me. I recognised him instantly as the man in whom I had been so much interested in Malar Kadir. He was now dressed in fashionable European attire, but there was no mistaking his face. I held out my hand. "'How do you do, Mr. Carne?' I cried. "'This is an unexpected pleasure. Pray, how long have you been in Calcutta?' "'I arrived last night,' he answered, "'and leave tomorrow morning for Burma. "'You see, I have taken your excellency at your word.' "'I am very pleased to see you,' I replied. "'I have the liveliest recollection of your kindness to me "'the day that I lost my way in the jungle. "'As you are leaving so soon, "'I fear we shall not have the pleasure of seeing much of you, "'but possibly you can dine with us this evening.' "'I shall be very glad to do so,' he answered simply, "'watching me with his wonderful eyes.' which somehow always reminded me of those of a collie. "'Her ladyship is devoted to Indian pottery and brasswork,' I said, "'and she would never forgive me if I did not give her an opportunity of consulting you upon her collection.' "'I shall be very proud to assist in any way I can,' he answered. "'Very well, then. We shall meet at eight. Good-bye.' That evening we had the pleasure of his society at dinner and I am prepared to state that a more interesting guest has never sat at a vice-regal table. My wife and daughters fell under his spell as quickly as I had done. Indeed, the former told me afterwards that she considered him the most uncommon man she had met during her residence in the East, an admission scarcely complimentary to the numerous important members of my council, who all prided themselves upon their originality. When he said goodbye, we had extorted his promise to call upon us in London, and I gathered later that my wife was prepared to make a lion of him when he should put in an appearance. How he did arrive in London during the first week of the following May, how it became known that he had taken Porchester House, which, as everyone knows, stands at the corner of Belverton Street and Park Lane, for the season, at an enormous rental, how he furnished it superbly, brought an army of Indian servants to wait upon him, and was prepared to astonish the town with his entertainments, are matters of history. I welcomed him to England, and he dined with us on the night following his arrival, and thus it was that we became, in a manner of speaking, his sponsors in society. When one looks back on that time, and remembers how vigorously, even in the midst of all that season's gaiety, our social world took him up, the fuss that was made of him, the manner in which his doings were chronicled by the press, it is indeed hard to realise how egregiously we were all being deceived. During the months of June and July, he was to be met at every house of distinction. Even royalty permitted itself to become on friendly terms with him, while it was rumoured that no fewer than three of the proudest beauties in England were prepared at any moment to accept his offer of marriage. To have been a social lion during such a brilliant season, to have been able to afford one of the most perfect residences in our great city, and to have written a book which the foremost authorities upon the subject declare a masterpiece, are things of which any man might be proud. And yet this was exactly what Simon Carne was, and did. And now, having described his advent among us, I must refer to the greatest excitement of all that year. Unique as was the occasion which prompted the gaiety of London, constant as were the arrivals and departures of illustrious folk, marvellous as were the social functions, and enormous the amount of money expended, it is strange that the things which attracted the most attention should be neither royal, social, nor political. As may be imagined, I am referring to the enormous robberies and swindles which will forever be associated with that memorable year. Day after day, for weeks at a time, the press chronicled a series of crimes, the like of which the oldest Englishman could not remember. It soon became evident that they were the work of one person, and that that person was a master hand, was as certain as his success. At first the police were positive that the depredations were conducted by a foreign gang, located somewhere in North London, and that they would soon be able to put their fingers on the culprits. But they were speedily undeceived. 
In spite of their efforts, the burglaries continued with painful regularity. Hardly a prominent person escaped. My friend, Lord Orpington, was despoiled of his priceless gold and silver plate. My cousin, the Duchess of Wiltshire, lost her world-famous diamonds. The Earl of Callingforth, his racehorse Vulcanite, and others of my friends were despoiled of their choicest possessions. How it was that I escaped, I can understand now, but I must confess that it passed my comprehension at the time. Throughout the season, Simon Carne and I scarcely spent a day apart. This society was like chloral. The more I took of it, the more I wanted, and I am now told that others were affected in the same way. I used to flatter myself that it was to my endeavours he owed his social success, and I can only in justice say that he tried to prove himself grateful. I have his portrait hanging in my library now, painted by a famous academician, with this inscription upon the lozenge at the base of the frame. To my kind friend, the Earl of Amberley, in remembrance of a happy and prosperous visit to London, from Simon Carne. The portrait represents him standing before a bookcase in a half-dark room. His extraordinary face, with its dark, penetrating eyes, is instinct with life, while his lips seem as if opening to speak. To my thinking, it would have been a better picture had he not been standing in such a way that the light accentuated his deformity. But it appears that this was the sitter's own desire, thus confirming what, on many occasions, I had felt compelled to believe namely that he was for some peculiar reason proud of his misfortune it was at the end of the cow's week that we parted company he had been racing his yacht the unknown quantity and as if not satisfied with having won the derby must needs appropriate the queen's cup it was on the day following that now famous race that half the leaders of london society bade him farewell on the deck of the steam yacht that was to carry him back to india a month later, and quite by chance, the dreadful truth came out. Then it was discovered that the man of whom we had all been making so much fuss, the man whom royalty had condescended to treat almost as a friend, was neither more nor less than a prince of swindlers, who had been utilising his splendid opportunities to the very best advantage. Every one will remember the excitement which followed the first disclosure of this dreadful secret, and the others which followed it. As fresh discoveries came to light, the popular interest became more and more intense, while the public's wonderment at the man's almost superhuman cleverness waxed every day greater than before. My position, as you may suppose, was not an enviable one. I saw how cleverly I had been duped, and when my friends, who had most of them suffered from his talents, congratulated me on my immunity, I could only console myself with the reflection that I was responsible for more than half the acquaintances the wretch had made. But deeply as I was drinking of the cup of sorrow, I had not come to the bottom of it yet. On Saturday evening, the 7th of November, if I recollect aright, I was sitting in my library, writing letters after dinner, when I heard the postman come round the square and finally ascend the steps of my house. A few moments later, a footman entered bearing some letters and a large packet upon a salver. Having read the former, I cut the string which bound the parcel and opened it. To my surprise, it contained a bundle of manuscript and a letter. The former I put aside while I broke open the envelope and extracted its contents. To my horror, it was from Simon Carne and ran as follows. On the high seas, my dear Lord Amberley, it is only reasonable to suppose that by this time you have become acquainted with the nature of the peculiar services you have rendered me. I am your debtor for as pleasant and, at the same time, as profitable a visit to London as any man could desire. In order that you may not think me ungrateful, I will ask you to accept the accompanying narrative of my adventures in your great metropolis. Since I have placed myself beyond the reach of capture, I will permit you to make any use of it you please. Doubtless you will blame me, but you must at least do me the justice to remember that, in spite of the splendid opportunities you permitted me, I invariably spared yourself and family. You will think me mad thus to betray myself, but believe me, I have taken the greatest precautions against discovery, and as I am proud of my London exploits, I have not the least desire to hide my light beneath a bushel. 
With kind regards to Lady Amberley and yourself, I am, yours very sincerely, Simon Carne. Needless to say, I did not retire to rest before I had read the manuscript through from beginning to end, with the result that the following morning I communicated with the police. They were hopeful that they might be able to discover the place where the packet had been posted, but after considerable search it was found that it had been handed by a captain of a yacht, name unknown, to the commander of a homeward-bound brig, off Finister, for postage in Plymouth. The narrative, as you will observe, is written in the third person, and as far as I can gather, the handwriting is not that of Simon Carne. As, however, the details of each individual swindle coincide exactly with the facts as ascertained by the police, there can be no doubt of their authenticity. A year has now elapsed since my receipt of the packet. During that time, the police of almost every civilised country have been on the alert to effect the capture of my whilom friend, but without success. Whether his yacht sank and conveyed him to the bottom of the ocean, or whether, as I suspect, she only carried him to a certain part of the seas, where he changed into another vessel, and so eluded justice, I cannot say. Even the Maharaja of Malar Kadir has heard nothing of him since. The fact, however, remains, I have, innocently enough, compounded a series of felonies, and, as I said at the commencement of this preface, the publication of the narrative I have so strangely received is intended to be, as far as possible, my excuse. End of chapter 1section two of a prince of swindlers by guy boothby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gillian hendry a prince of swindlers by guy boothby chapter two the den of iniquity the night was close and muggy such a night, indeed, as only Calcutta, of all the great cities of the East, can produce. The reek of the native quarter, that sickly, penetrating odour which once smelt, is never forgotten, filled the streets and even invaded the sacred precincts of Government House, where a man of gentlemanly appearance, but sadly deformed, was engaged in bidding Her Majesty the Queen of England's representative in India an almost affectionate farewell. "'You will not forget your promise to acquaint us with your arrival in London,' said His Excellency, as he shook his guest by the hand. "'We shall be delighted to see you, and if we can make your stay pleasurable as well as profitable to you, you may be sure we shall endeavour to do so.' "'Your Lordship is most hospitable, and I think I may safely promise that I will avail myself of your kindness,' replied the other. "'In the meantime, good-bye, and a pleasant voyage to you.' A few minutes later he had passed the sentry, and was making his way along the Maidan to the point where the Chitpur road crosses it. Here he stopped and appeared to deliberate. He smiled a little sardonically, as the recollection of the evening's entertainment crossed his mind, and as if he feared he might forget something connected with it, when he reached a lamp-post, took a notebook from his pocket, and made an entry in it. "'Providence has really been most kind,' he said, as he shut the book with a snap, and returned it to his pocket. And what is more, I am prepared to be properly grateful. It was a good morning's work for me when His Excellency decided to take a ride through the Maharaja's suburbs. Now I have only to play my cards carefully, and success should be assured. He took a cigar from his pocket, nipped off the end, and then lit it. He was still smiling when the smoke had cleared away. It is fortunate that Her Excellency is, like myself, an enthusiastic admirer of Indian art, he said. It is a trump card, and I shall play it for all it's worth when I get to the other side. But tonight I have something of more importance to consider. I have to find the sinews of war. Let us hope that the luck which has followed me hitherto will still hold good, and that Liz will prove as tractable as usual. Almost as he concluded his soliloquy, a tikagari made its appearance, and without being hailed, pulled up beside him. It was evident that their meeting was intentional, for the driver asked no question of his fare, who simply took his seat, laid himself back upon the cushions, and smoked his cigar with the air of a man playing a part in some performance that had been long arranged. 
Ten minutes later the coachman had turned out of the Chitpore Road into a narrow by-street. From this he broke off into another, and at the end of a few minutes into still another. These offshoots of the main thoroughfare were wrapped in inky darkness, and in order that there should be as much danger as possible, they were crowded to excess. To those who know Calcutta, this information will be significant. There are slums in all the great cities of the world, and every one boasts its own peculiar characteristics. The Ratcliffe Highway in London, and the streets that lead off it, can show a fair assortment of vice. The Chinese quarters of New York, Chicago, and San Francisco can more than equal them. Little Burke Street, Melbourne, a portion of Singapore, and the shipping quarter of Bombay have their own individual qualities. But surely for the lowest of all the world's low places, one must go to Calcutta, the capital of our great Indian Empire. Surrounding the Lai, Manchua, Bura, and Joira bazaars, are to be found the most infamous dens that mind of man can conceive. But that is not all. If an exhibition of scented, high-toned, gold-lacquered vice is required, one has only to make one's way into the streets that lie within a stone's throw of the Chitpur Road to be accommodated. Reaching a certain corner, the gari came to a standstill, and the fare alighted. He said something in an undertone to the driver as he paid him, and then stood upon the footway, placidly smoking until the vehicle had disappeared from view. When it was no longer in sight, he looked up at the houses towering above his head. In one, a marriage feast was being celebrated. Across the way, the sound of a woman's voice in angry expostulation could be heard. The passers-by, all of whom were natives, scanned him curiously, but made no remark. Englishmen, it is true, were sometimes seen in that quarter and at that hour, but this one seemed of a different class and it is possible that nine out of every ten took him for the most detested of all Englishmen, a police officer. For upwards of ten minutes he waited, but after that he seemed to become impatient. The person he had expected to find at the rendezvous had so far failed to put in an appearance, and he was beginning to wonder what he had better do in the event of his not coming. But badly as he had started, he was not destined to fail in his enterprise for just as his patience was exhausted, he saw hastening towards him a man whom he recognised as the person for whom he waited. "'You are late,' he said in English, which he was aware the other spoke fluently, though he was averse to owning it. "'I have been here more than a quarter of an hour.' "'It was impossible that I could get away before,' the other answered cringingly. "'But if your excellency will be pleased to follow me now, I will conduct you to the person you seek, without further delay.' Lead on, said the Englishman. We have wasted enough time already. Without more ado, the babu turned himself about and proceeded in the direction he had come, never pausing save to glance over his shoulder to make sure that his companion was following. Seemingly countless were the lanes, streets, and alleys through which they passed. The place was nothing more nor less than a rabbit warren of small passages, and so dark that at times it was as much as the Englishman could do to see his guide ahead of him. Well acquainted as he was with the quarter, he had never been able to make himself master of all its intricacies, and as the person whom he was going to meet was compelled to change her residence at frequent intervals, he had long given up the idea of endeavouring to find her himself. Turning out of a narrow lane, which differed from its fellows only in the fact that it contained more dirt and a greater number of unsavoury odours, they found themselves at the top of a short flight of steps which in their turn conducted them to a small square, round which rose houses taller than any they had yet discovered. Every window contained a balcony, some larger than others, but all in the last stage of decay. The effect was peculiar, but not so strange as the quiet of the place. Indeed, the wind and the far-off hum of the city were the only sounds to be heard. Now and again figures issued from the different doorways, stood for a moment looking anxiously about them, and then disappeared as silently as they had come. All the time not a light was to be seen, nor the sound of a human voice. It was a strange place for a white man to be in, and so Simon Carne evidently thought, as he obeyed his guide's invitation and entered the last house on the right-hand side. Whether the buildings had been originally intended for residences or for offices, it would be difficult to say, 
They were almost as old as John Company himself, and would not appear to have been cleaned or repaired since they had been first inhabited. From the centre of the hall in which he found himself, a massive staircase led to the other floors, and up this Carne marched behind his conductor. On gaining the first landing, he paused, while the babu went forward and knocked at the door. A moment later, the shutter of a small grill was pulled back, and the face of a native woman looked out. A muttered conversation ensued, and after it was finished, the door was opened, and Carne was invited to enter. This summons he obeyed with alacrity, only to find that once he was inside, the door was immediately shut and barred behind him. After the darkness of the street and the semi-obscurity of the stairs, the dazzling light of the apartment in which he now stood was almost too much for his eyes. It was not long, however, before he had recovered sufficiently to look about him. The room was a fine one, in shape almost square, with a large window at the further end, covered with a thick curtain of native cloth. It was furnished with considerable taste, in a mixture of styles, half European and half native. A large lamp of worked brass, burning some sweet-smelling oil, was suspended from the ceiling. A quantity of tapestry, much of it extremely rare, covered the walls, relieved here and there with some superb specimens of native weapons. Comfortable divans were scattered about, as if inviting repose, and as if further to carry out this idea, beside one of the lounges, a silver-mounted margal was placed, its tube curled up beside it, in a fashion somewhat suggestive of a snake. But, luxurious as it all was, it was evidently not quite what Carne had expected to find, and the change seemed to mystify as much as it surprised him. Just as he was coming to a decision, however, his ear caught the sound of chinking bracelets, and next moment the curtain which covered a doorway in the left wall was drawn aside by a hand glistening with rings and as tiny as that of a little child. A second later, Trincomali Liz entered the room. Standing in the doorway, the heavily embroidered curtain falling in thick folds behind her and forming a most effective background, she made a picture such as few men could look upon without a thrill of admiration. At that time she, the famous Trincomalee Liz, whose doings had made her notorious from the Sagalian coast to the shores of the Persian Gulf, was at the prime of her life and beauty, a beauty such as no man who has ever seen it will ever forget. It was a notorious fact that those tiny hands had ruined more men than any other half-dozen pairs in the whole of India, or the East for that matter. Not much was known of her history, but what had come to light was certainly interesting. As far as could be ascertained, she was born in Tonka. Her father, it had been said, was a handsome but disreputable Frenchman, who had called himself a count, and over his absinthe was wont to talk of his possessions in Normandy. Her mother hailed from northern India, and she herself was lovelier than the pale hibiscus blossom. To tell in what manner Liz and Carne had become acquainted would be too long a story to be included here. But that there was some bond between the pair is a fact that may be stated without fear of contradiction. On seeing her, the visitor rose from his seat and went to meet her. "'So you have come at last,' she said, holding out both hands to him. "'I have been expecting you these three weeks past. Remember, you told me you were coming.' "'I was prevented,' said Carne, "'and the business upon which I desire to see you was not fully matured.' "'So there is business, then,' she answered with a pretty petulance. "'I thought as much. "'I might know by this time that you do not come to see me for anything else. "'But there, do not let us talk in this fashion "'when I have not had you with me for nearly a year. "'Tell me of yourself, and what you have been doing since last we met.' "'As she spoke, she was occupied preparing a hookah for him. "'When it was ready, she fitted a tiny amber mouthpiece to the tube and presented it to him with a compliment as delicate as her own rose-leaf hands. Then, seating herself on a pile of cushions beside him, she bade him proceed with his narrative. And now, she said when he had finished, what is this business that brings you to me? A few moments elapsed before he began his explanation, and during that time he studied her face closely. I have a scheme in my head, he said, laying the hookah stick carefully upon the floor that, properly carried out, should make us both rich beyond telling. But to carry it out properly, I must have your cooperation. 
She laughed softly and nodded her head. You mean that you want money, she answered. Ah, Simon, you always want money. I do want money, he replied without hesitation. I want it badly. Listen to what I have to say, and then tell me if you can give it to me. You know what year this is in England? She nodded her head. There were few things with which she had not some sort of acquaintance. It will be a time of great rejoicing, he continued. Half the princes of the earth will be assembled in London. There will be wealth untold there, to be had for the mere gathering in. And who is so well able to gather it as I? I tell you, Liz, I have made up my mind to make the journey and try my luck. And if you will help me with the money, you shall have it back with such jewels for interest as no woman ever wore yet. To begin with, there is the Duchess of Wiltshire's necklace. Ah, your eyes light up. You have heard of it. I have, she answered, her voice trembling with excitement. Who has not? It is the finest thing of its kind in Europe, if not in the world, he went on slowly, as if to allow time for his words to sink in. It consists of three hundred stones, and is worth, apart from its historic value, at least fifty thousand pounds. He saw her hands tighten on the cushions upon which she sat. Fifty thousand pounds! That is five lakhs of rupees. Exactly. Five lakhs of rupees, a king's ransom, he answered. But that is not all. There will be twice as much to be had for the taking when once I get there. Find me the money I want, and those stones shall be your property. How much do you want? The value of the necklace, he answered. Fifty thousand pounds. It is a large sum, she said, and it will be difficult to find. He smiled, as if her words were a joke and should be treated as such. The interest will be good, he answered. But are you certain of obtaining it? she asked. Have I ever failed yet? he replied. You have done wonderful things, certainly, but this time you are attempting so much. The greater the glory, he answered. I have prepared my plans, and I shall not fail. This is going to be the greatest undertaking of my life. If it comes off successfully, I shall retire upon my laurels. Come, for the sake of, well, you know for the sake of what. Will you let me have the money? It is not the first time you have done it, and on each occasion you have not only been repaid, but well rewarded into the bargain. When do you want it? By midday tomorrow. It must be paid into my account at the bank before twelve o'clock. You will have no difficulty in obtaining it, I know. Your respectable merchant friends will do it for you, if you but hold up your little finger. If they don't feel inclined, then put on the screw and make them. She laughed as he paid this tribute to her power. A moment later, however, she was all gravity. And the security? He leant towards her and whispered in her ear. It is well, she replied. The money shall be found for you tomorrow. Now tell me your plans. I must know all that you intend doing. In the first place, he answered, drawing a little closer to her, and speaking in a lower voice, so that no eavesdropper should hear, I shall take with me Abdul Khan, Ram Gafur, Jovar Singh, and Noor Ali, with others of less note as servants. I shall engage the best house in London, and under the wing of our gracious viceroy, who has promised me the light of his countenance, will work my way into the highest society. That done, I shall commence operations. No one shall ever suspect. And when it is finished, and you have accomplished your desires, how will you escape? That I have not yet arranged, but of this you may be sure. I shall run no risks. And afterwards? He leant a little towards her again, and patted her affectionately upon the hand. Then we shall see what we shall see, he said. I don't think you will find me ungrateful. She shook her pretty head. It is good talk, she cried, but it means nothing. You always say the same. How am I to know that you will not learn to love one of the white memsahibs when you are so much among them? Because there is but one, Trincomalee Liz, he answered and for that reason you need have no fear. Her face expressed the doubt with which she received this assertion. As she had said, it was not the first time she had been cajoled into advancing him large sums with the same assurance. 
He knew this, and, lest she should alter her mind, prepared to change the subject. Besides the others, I must take Hiram Singh and Wajib Baksh. They are in Calcutta, I am told, and I must communicate with them before noon tomorrow. They are the most expert craftsmen in India, and I shall have need of them. I will have them found, and word shall be sent to you. Could I not meet them here? Nay, it is impossible. I shall not be here myself. I leave for Madras within six hours. Is there then trouble toward? She smiled, and spread her hands apart with a gesture that said, Who knows? He did not question her further, but after a little conversation on the subject of the money, rose to bid her farewell. I do not like this idea, she said, standing before him and looking him in the face. It is too dangerous. Why should you run such risk? Let us go to Burma. You shall be my vizier. I would wish for nothing better, he said, were it not that I am resolved to go to England. My mind is set upon it, and when I have done, London shall have something to talk about for years to come. If you are determined, I will say no more, she answered. But when it is over, and you are free, we will talk again. You will not forget about the money? he asked anxiously. She stamped her foot. Money, 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 she cried. It is always the money of which you think. But you shall have it, never fear. And now, when shall I see you again? In six months' time, at a place of which I will tell you beforehand. It is a long time to wait. There is a necklace worth five lakhs to pay you for the waiting. Then I will be patient. Good-bye. Good-bye, little friend, he said. And then, as if he thought he had not said enough, he added, Think sometimes of Simon Carne. She promised with many pretty speeches to do so, after which he left the room and went downstairs. As he reached the bottom step, he heard a cough in the dark above him, and looked up. He could just distinguish Liz leaning over the rail. Then something dropped and rattled upon the wooden steps behind him. He picked it up to find that it was an antique ring, set with rubies. Wear it, that it may bring thee luck, she cried, and then disappeared again. He put the present on his finger and went out into the dark square. The money is found, he said, as he looked up at the starelit heavens. Hiram Singh and Wajib Baksh are to be discovered before noon tomorrow. His Excellency the Viceroy and his amiable lady have promised to stand sponsors for me in London society. If with these advantages I don't succeed, well, all I can say is, I don't deserve to. Now, where is my Babuji? Almost at the same instant, a figure appeared from the shadow of the building and approached him. If the sahib will permit me, I will guide him by a short road to his hotel. Lead on, then. I am tired, and it is time I was in bed. Then to himself he added, I must sleep tonight, for tomorrow there are great things toward. End of section 2section 3 of a prince of swindlers by guy boothby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gillian henry a prince of swindlers by guy boothby chapter 3 part 1 the duchess of wiltshire's diamonds to the reflective mind the rapidity with which the inhabitants of the world's greatest city seize upon a new name or idea and familiarize themselves with it can scarcely prove otherwise than astonishing. As an illustration of my meaning, let me take the case of Klimo, the now famous private detective, who has won for himself the right to be considered as great as Lecoq, or even the late lamented Sherlock Holmes. Up to a certain morning, London had never even heard his name nor had it the remotest notion as to who or what he might be. It was as sublimely ignorant and careless on the subject as the inhabitants of Kamchatka or Peru. Within twenty-four hours, however, the whole aspect of the case was changed. The man, woman or child who had not seen his posters or heard his name was counted an ignoramus, unworthy of intercourse with human beings. Princes became familiar with it, as their trains bore them to Windsor to luncheon with the Queen. The nobility noticed and commented upon it as they drove about the town. 
merchants, and businessmen generally, read it as they made their ways by omnibus or underground, to their various shops and counting-houses. Street boys called each other by it as a nickname. Music hall artists introduced it into their patter, while it was even rumoured that the stock exchange itself has paused in the full flood tide of business to manufacture a riddle on the subject. That Climo made his profession pay him well was certain, first from the fact that his advertisements must have cost a good round sum, and second because he had taken a mansion in Belverton Street, Park Lane, next door to Porchester House, where, to the dismay of that aristocratic neighbourhood, he advertised that he was prepared to receive and be consulted by his clients. The invitation was responded to with alacrity, and from that day forward, between the hours of twelve and two, the pavement upon the north side of the street was lined with carriages, every one containing some person desirous of testing the great man's skill. I must here explain that I have narrated all this in order to show the state of affairs existing in Belverton Street and Park Lane when Simon Carne arrived, or was supposed to arrive, in England. If my memory serves me correctly, it was on Wednesday the 3rd of May that the Earl of Ambury drove to Victoria to meet and welcome the man whose acquaintance he had made in India under such peculiar circumstances, and under the spell of whose fascination he and his family had fallen so completely. Reaching the station, his lordship descended from his carriage, and made his way to the platform set apart for the reception of the Continental Express. He walked with a jaunty air, and seemed to be on the best of terms with himself and the world in general. How little he suspected the existence of the noose into which he was so innocently running his head. As if out of compliment to his arrival, the train put in an appearance within a few moments of his reaching the platform. He immediately placed himself in such a position that he could make sure of seeing the man he wanted, and waited patiently until he should come in sight. Carne, however, was not among the first batch. Indeed, the majority of passengers had passed before his lordship caught sight of him. One thing was very certain. However great the crush might have been, it would have been difficult to mistake Carne's figure. The man's infirmity and the peculiar beauty of his face rendered him easily recognisable. Possibly after his long sojourn in India, he found the morning cold, for he wore a long fur coat, the collar of which he had turned up around his ears, thus making a fitting frame for his delicate face. On seeing Lord Amberley, he hastened forward to greet him. "'This is most kind and friendly of you,' he said as he shook the other by the hand. "'A fine day, and Lord Amberley to meet me. One could scarcely imagine a better welcome.' As he spoke, one of his Indian servants approached and salaamed before him. He gave him an order and received an answer in Hindustani, whereupon he turned again to Lord Amberley. "'You may imagine how anxious I am to see my new dwelling,' he said. "'My servant tells me that my carriage is here, so may I hope that you will drive back with me and see for yourself how I am likely to be lodged?' "'I shall be delighted,' said Lord Amberley, who was longing for an opportunity, and they accordingly went out into the station-yard together to discover a brougham, drawn by two magnificent horses, and with Nur Ali in all the glory of white raiment and crested turban, on the box, waiting to receive them. His lordship dismissed his Victoria, and when Jover Singh had taken his place beside his fellow-servant upon the box, the carriage rolled out of the station-yard in the direction of Hyde Park. "'I trust her ladyship is quite well,' said Simon Carne politely, as they turned into Gloucester Place. "'Excellently well, thank you,' replied his lordship. "'She bade me welcome you to England, in her name as well as my own.' and I was to say that she is looking forward to seeing you. She is most kind, and I shall do myself the honour of calling upon her as soon as circumstances will permit, answered Karen. I beg you will convey my best thanks to her for her thought of me. While these polite speeches were passing between them, they were rapidly approaching a large billboard, on which was displayed a poster, getting forth the name of the now famous detective, Climo. Simon Karn, leaning forward, studied it, and when they had passed, turned to his friend again. At Victoria, and on all the billboards we met, I see an enormous placard bearing the word Climo. Pray, what does it mean? His lordship laughed. 
you are asking a question which a month ago was on the lips of nine out of every ten londoners it is only within the last fortnight that we have learned who and what climo is and pray what is he well the explanation is very simple he is neither more nor less than a remarkably astute private detective who has succeeded in attracting notice in such a way that half london has been induced to patronize him i have had dealings with the man myself but a friend of mine lord orpington has been the victim of a most audacious burglary and the police having failed to solve the mystery he has called climo in we shall therefore see what he can do before many days are past but there i expect you will soon know more about him than any of us indeed and why for the simple reason that he has taken number one belverton terrace the house adjoining your own and sees his clients there simon carne pursed up his lips and appeared to be considering something i trust he will not prove a nuisance he said at last the agents who found me the house should have acquainted me with the fact private detectives on however large a scale scarcely strike one as the most desirable of neighbours particularly for a man who is so fond of quiet as myself at this moment they were approaching their destination as the carriage passed belverton street and pulled up lord amberley pointed to a long line of vehicles standing before the detective's door you can see for yourself something of the business he does he said those are the carriages of his clients and it is probable that twice as many have arrived on foot i shall certainly speak to the agent on the subject said carne with a show of annoyance upon his face i consider the fact of this man's being so close to me a serious drawback to the house jover singh here descended from the box and opened the door in order that his master and his guest might alight while portly ram gaufour the butler came down the steps and salaamed before them with oriental obsequiousness carne greeted his domestics with kindly condescension and then accompanied by the ex-viceroy entered his new abode i think you may congratulate yourself upon having secured one of the most desirable residences in london said his lordship ten minutes or so later when they had explored the principal rooms i am very glad to hear you say so said carne i trust your lordship will remember that you will always be welcome in the house as long as i am its owner it's very kind of you to say so returned lord amberley warmly i shall look forward to some months of pleasant intercourse and now i must be going to-morrow perhaps if you have nothing better to do you will give us the pleasure of your company at dinner your fame has already gone abroad and we shall ask one or two nice people to meet you including my brother and sister-in-law lord and lady gelpington lord and lady orpington and my cousin the duchess of wiltshire whose interest in china and indian art as perhaps you know is only second to your own i shall be more glad to come we may count on seeing you in eaton square then at eight o'clock if i am alive you may be sure i shall be there must you really go then good-bye and many thanks for meeting me his lordship having left the house simon carne went upstairs to his dressing-room which it was to be noticed he found without inquiry and rang the electric bell beside the fireplace three times while he was waiting for it to be answered he stood looking out of the window at the long line of carriages in the street below. "'Everything is progressing admirably,' he said to himself. "'Umberley does not suspect any more than the world in general. As a proof, he asks me to dinner tomorrow evening to meet his brother and sister-in-law, two of his particular friends, and above all, her grace of Wiltshire. Of course I shall go, and when I bid her grace good-bye, it will be strange if i am not one step nearer the interest on liz's money at this moment the door opened and his valet the grave and respectable belton entered the room carne turned to greet him impatiently come come belton he said we must be quick it is twenty minutes to twelve and if we don't hurry the folk next door will become impatient have you succeeded in doing what i spoke to you about last night i have done everything sir i am glad to hear it now lock that door and let us get to work you can let me have your news while i am dressing opening one side of the massive wardrobe that completely filled one end of the room belton took from it a number of garments they included a well-worn velvet coat a baggy pair of trousers 
so old that only a notorious pauper or a millionaire could have afforded to wear them. A flannel waistcoat, a gladstone collar, a soft silk tie, and a pair of embroidered carpet slippers, upon which no old clothesman in the most reckless way of business in Petticoat Lane would have advanced a single halfpenny. Into these he assisted his master to change. Now give me the wig and unfasten the straps of this hump, said Carne, as the other placed the garments just referred to upon a neighbouring chair. Belton did as he was ordered, and then there happened a thing the like of which no one would have believed. Having unbuckled a strap on either shoulder and slipped his hand beneath the waistcoat, he withdrew a large papier-mâché hump, which he carried away and carefully placed in a drawer of the bureau. Relieved of his burden, Simon Carne stood up as straight and well-made a man as any in Her Majesty's dominions. The malformation, for which so many, including the Earl and Countess of Amberley, had often pitied him, was nothing but a hoax, intended to produce an effect which would permit him additional facilities of disguise. The hump discarded, and the grey wig fitted carefully to his head, in such a manner that not even a pinch of his own curly locks could be seen beneath it, he adorned his cheeks with a pair of crepu hair whiskers, donned the flannel vest and the velvet coat previously mentioned, slipped his feet into the carpet slippers, placed a pair of smoked glasses upon his nose, and declared himself ready to proceed about his business. The man who would have known him for Simon Carne would have been as astute as, well, shall we say, as the private detective, Climo himself. "'It's on the stroke of twelve, he said, as he gave a final glance at himself in the pier glass above the dressing table, and arranged his tie to his satisfaction. "'Should any one call, instruct Ram Gafur to tell them that I have gone out on business, and shall not be back until three o'clock.' "'Very good, sir. Now undo the door and let me go in.' Thus commanded, Belton went across to the large wardrobe, which, as I have already said, covered the whole of one side of the room, and opened the middle door. Two or three garments were seen inside, suspended on pegs, and these he removed, at the same time pushing towards the right the panel at the rear. When this was done, a large aperture in the wall between the two houses was disclosed. Through this door, Carn passed, drawing it behind him. In number one Belverton Terrace, the house occupied by the detective, whose presence in the street Carn seemed to find so objectionable, the entrance thus constructed was covered by the peculiar type of confessional box in which Climo invariably sat to receive his clients, the rearmost panels of which opened in the same fashion as those in the wardrobe in the dressing room. These being pulled aside, he had but to draw them to again after him, take his seat, ring the electric bell to inform his housekeeper that he was ready, and then welcome his clients as quickly as they cared to come. Punctually at two o'clock, the interview ceased, and Climo, having reaped an excellent harvest of fees, returned to Porchester House to become Simon Carne once more. Possibly it was due to the fact that the Earl and Countess of Amberley were brimming over with his praise, or it may have been the rumour that he was worth as many millions as you have fingers upon your hand that did it. One thing, however, was self-evident. Within twenty-four hours of the noble earl's meeting him at Victoria Station, Simon Carne was the talk of not only fashionable, but also of unfashionable London. That his household were, with one exception, natives of India, that he had paid a rental for Porchester House, which ran into five figures, that he was the greatest living authority upon China and Indian art generally, and that he had come over to England in search of a wife, were among the smallest of the canards set afloat concerning him. During dinner next evening, Carne put forth every effort to please. He was placed on the right hand of his hostess, and next to the Duchess of Wiltshire. To the latter he paid particular attention, and to such good purpose that when the ladies returned to the drawing-room afterwards, her grace was full of his praises. They had discussed china of all sorts. Carne had promised her a specimen which she had longed for all her life, but had never been able to obtain, and in return she had promised to show him the quaintly carved Indian casket, in which the famous necklace, of which he had of course heard, spent most of its time. She would be wearing the jewels in question at her own ball in a week's time, she informed him 
and if he would care to see the case when it came from her bankers on that day, she would be only too pleased to show it to him. As Simon Carne drove home in his luxurious brougham afterwards, he smiled to himself as he thought of the success which was attending his first endeavour. Two of the guests, who were stewards of the jockey club, had heard with delight his idea of purchasing a house, in order to have an interest in the derby, while another, on hearing that he desired to become the possessor of a yacht, had offered to propose him for the RCYC. To crown it all, however, and much better than all, the Duchess of Wiltshire had promised to show him her famous diamonds. By this time next week, he said to himself, Liz's interest should be considerably closer. But satisfactory as my progress has been hitherto, it is difficult to see how I am to get possession of the stones. From what I have been able to discover, they are only brought from the bank on the day the Duchess intends to wear them, and they are taken back by His Grace the morning following. While she has got them on her person, it would be manifestly impossible to get them from her, and as, when she takes them off, they are returned to their box and placed in a safe, constructed in the wall of the bedroom adjoining, and which for the occasion is occupied by the butler and one of the under-footmen, the only key being in the possession of the duke himself, it would be equally foolish to hope to appropriate them. In what manner, therefore, I am to become their possessor, passes my comprehension. However, one thing is certain. Obtained they must be, and the attempt must be made on the night of the ball, if possible. In the meantime, I'll set my wits to work out a plan. Next day, Simon Carne was the recipient of an invitation to the ball in question, and two days later he called upon the Duchess of Wiltshire at her residence in Belgrave Square, with a plan prepared. He also took with him the small vase he had promised her four nights before. She received him most graciously, and their talk fell at once into the usual channel. Having examined her collection and charmed her by means of one or two judicious criticisms, he asked permission to include photographs of certain of her treasures in his forthcoming book. Then, little by little, he skilfully guided the conversation onto the subject of jewels. "'Since we are discussing gems, Mr. Carne, she said, "'perhaps it would interest you to see my famous necklace. "'By good fortune I have it in the house now, "'for the reason that an alteration is being made to one of the clasps by my jewellers.' "'I should like to see it immensely,' answered Carne. "'At one time and another I have had the good fortune to examine "'the jewels of the leading Indian princes.' and I should like to be able to say that I have seen the famous Wiltshire necklace. Then you shall certainly have the honour, she answered with a smile. If you will ring that bell, I will send for it. Carne rang the bell as requested, and when the butler entered, he was given the key of the safe, and ordered to bring the case to the drawing-room. We must not keep it very long, she observed while the man was absent. It is to be returned to the bank in an hour's time. I am indeed fortunate, Carne replied, and turned to the description of some curious Indian wood carving, of which he was making a special feature in his book. As he explained, he had collected his illustrations from the doors of Indian temples, from the gateways of palaces, from old brasswork, and even from carved chairs and boxes he had picked up in all sorts of odd corners. Her grace was most interested. How strange that you should have mentioned it, she said. If carved boxes have any interest for you, it is possible my jewel case itself may be of use to you. As I think I told you during Lady Amberley's dinner, it came from Benares, and has carved upon it the portraits of nearly every god in the Hindu pantheon. You raise my curiosity to fever heat, said Carne. A few moments later, the servant returned, bringing with him a wooden box about sixteen inches long, by twelve wide and eight deep, which he placed upon a table beside his mistress, after which he retired. "'This is the case to which I have just been referring,' said the Duchess, placing her hand on the article in question. "'If you glance at it, you will see how exquisitely it is carved.' Concealing his eagerness with an effort, Simon Carne drew his chair up to the table and examined the box. It was with justice she had described it as a work of art. 
What the wood was of which it was constructed, Carne was unable to tell. It was dark and heavy, and though it was not teak, it closely resembled it. It was literally covered with quaint carving, and of its kind was a unique work of art. It is most curious and beautiful, said Carne, when he had finished his examination. In all my experience, I can safely say I have never seen its equal. If you will permit me, I should very much like to include a description and an illustration of it in my book. Of course you may do so. I shall be only too delighted, answered her grace. If it will help you in your work, I shall be glad to lend it to you for a few hours, in order that you may have the illustration made. This was exactly what Carne had been waiting for and accepted the offer with alacrity. "'Very well, then,' she said. "'On the day of my ball, when it will be brought from the bank again, I will take the necklace out and send the case to you. I must make one proviso, however, and that is that you let me have it back the same day.' "'I will certainly promise to do that,' replied Carne. "'And now let us look inside,' said his hostess. Choosing a key from a bunch carried in her pocket, she unlocked the casket and lifted the lid. Accustomed as Carne had all his life been to the sight of gems, what he then saw before him almost took his breath away. The inside of the box, both sides and bottom, was quilted with the softest Russian leather, and on this luxurious couch reposed the famous necklace. The fire of the stones, when the light caught them, was sufficient to dazzle the eyes, so fierce was it. As Carne could see, every gem was perfect of its kind, and there were no fewer than three hundred of them. The setting was a fine example of the jeweller's art, and last but not least, the value of the whole affair was fifty thousand pounds, a mere flea-bite to the man who had given it to his wife, but a fortune to any humbler person. "'And now that you have seen my property, what do you think of it?' asked the Duchess as she watched her visitor's face. It is very beautiful, he answered, and I do not wonder that you are proud of it. Yes, the diamonds are very fine, but I think it is their abiding place that fascinates me more. Have you any objection to my measuring it? Pray do so, if it's likely to be of any assistance to you, replied her grace. Carn thereupon produced a small ivory rule, ran it over the box, and the figures he thus obtained he jotted down in his pocket-book. Ten minutes later, when the case had been returned to the safe, he thanked the Duchess for her kindness, and took his departure, promising to call in person for the empty case on the morning of the ball. Reaching home, he passed into his study, and seating himself at his writing-table, pulled a sheet of note-paper towards him, and began to sketch, as well as he could remember it, the box he had seen. Then he leant back in his chair and closed his eyes. I have cracked a good many hard nuts in my time, he said reflectively, but never one that seemed so difficult at first sight as this. As far as I see at present, the case stands as follows. The box will be brought from the bank, where it usually reposes, to Wiltshire House on the morning of the dance. I shall be allowed to have possession of it, without the stones, of course, for a period possibly extending from eleven o'clock in the morning to four or five, at any rate, not later than seven in the evening. After the ball, the necklace will be returned to it, when it will be locked up in the safe, over which the butler and a footman will mount guard. To get into the room during the night is not only too risky, but physically out of the question, while to rob her grace of her treasure during the progress of the dance would be equally impossible. The duke fetches the casket and takes it back to the bank himself, so that to all intents and purposes I am almost as far off the solution as ever. Half an hour went by and found him still seated at his desk, staring at the drawing on the paper. Then an hour. The traffic of the streets rolled past the house unheeded. Finally, Jover Singh announced his carriage, and feeling that an idea might come to him with a change of scene, he set off for a drive in the park. By this time his elegant mail phaeton with its magnificent horses and Indian servant on the seat behind, was as well known as Her Majesty's state equipage, and attracted almost as much attention. 
Today, however, the fashionable world noticed that Simon Carne looked preoccupied. He was still working out his problem, but so far without much success. Suddenly something, no one will ever be able to say what, put an idea into his head. The notion was no sooner born in his brain than he left the park and drove quickly home. Ten minutes had scarcely elapsed before he was back in his study again and had ordered that Wajib Baksh should be sent to him. When the man he wanted put in an appearance, Carne handed him the paper upon which he had made the drawing of the jewel case. Look at that, he said, and tell me what thou seest there. I see a box, answered the man who by this time was well accustomed to his master's ways. As thou sayest, it is a box, said Carne. The wood is heavy and thick, though what wood it is I do not know. The measurements are upon the paper below. Within, both the sides and bottom are quilted with soft leather, as I have also shown. Think now, Wajib Baksh, for in this case thou wilt need to have all thy wits about thee. Tell me, is it in thy power... Almost cunning of all craftsmen, to insert such extra sides within this box that they, being held by a spring, shall lie so snug as not to be noticeable to the ordinary eye? Can it be so arranged that when the box is locked they shall fall flat upon the bottom, thus covering and holding fast what lies beneath them, and yet making the box appear to the eye as if it were empty? Is it possible for thee to do such a thing? Wajib Baksh did not reply for a few moments. His instinct told him what his master wanted, and he was not disposed to answer hastily, for he also saw that his reputation as the most cunning craftsman in India was at stake. "'If the heaven-born will permit me the night for thought,' he said at last, "'I will come to him when he rises from his bed and tell him what I can do, and he can then give his orders.' Very good, said Carne. Then tomorrow morning I shall expect thy report. Let the work be good, and there will be many rupees for thee to touch in return. As to the lock and the way it shall act, let that be the concern of Hiram Singh. Wajib Baksh salamed and withdrew, and Simon Carne for the time being dismissed the matter from his mind. End of section three. Section 4 of A Prince of Swindlers by Guy Boothby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Henry. A Prince of Swindlers by Guy Boothby. Chapter 3, Part 2. Next morning, while he was dressing, Belton reported that the two artificers desired an interview with him. He ordered them to be admitted, and forthwith they entered the room. It was noticeable that Wajib Baksh carried in his hand a heavy box, which he placed upon the table. "'Have you thought over the matter?' he asked, seeing that the men waited for him to speak. "'We have thought of it,' replied Hiram Singh, who always acted as spokesman for the pair. "'If the presence will deign to look,' he will see that we have made a box of the size and shape as he drew upon the paper. Yes, it is certainly a good copy, said Carne condescendingly, after he had examined it. Wajib Baksh showed his white teeth in appreciation of the compliment, and Hiram Singh drew closer to the table. And now, if the sahab will open it, he will in his wisdom be able to tell if it resembles the other that he has in his mind. Carne opened the box as requested and discovered that the interior was an exact counterfeit of the Duchess of Wiltshire's jewel case, even to the extent of the quilted leather lining, which had been the other's principal feature. He admitted that the likeness was all that could be desired. As he is satisfied, said Hiram Singh, it may be that the protector of the poor will deign to try an experiment with it. See, here is a comb. Let it be placed in the box, so... Now he will see what he will see. The broad silver-backed comb, lying upon his dressing-table, was placed on the bottom of the box. The lid was closed and the key turned in the lock. The case being securely fastened, Hiram Singh laid it before his master. I am to open it, I suppose, 
said Carne, taking the key and replacing it in the lock. If my master pleases, replied the other. Carne accordingly turned it in the lock, and having done so, raised the lid and looked inside. His astonishment was complete. To all intents and purposes, the box was empty. The comb was not to be seen, and yet the quilted sides and bottom were to all appearances just the same as when he had first looked inside. This is most wonderful, he said, and indeed it was as clever a conjuring trick as any he had ever seen. Nay, it is very simple, Wajib Baksh replied. The heaven-born told me that there must be no risk of detection. He took the box in his own hands, and running his nails down the centre of the quilting, divided the false bottom into two pieces. These he lifted out, revealing the comb lying upon the real bottom beneath. The sides, as my lord will see, said Hiram Singh, taking a step forward, are held in their appointed places by these two springs. Thus, when the key is turned, the springs relax, and the sides are driven by others into their places on the bottom, where the seams in the quilting mask the joint. There is but one disadvantage. It is as follows. When the pieces which form the bottom are lifted out in order, that my lord may get at whatever lies concealed beneath, the springs must of necessity stand revealed. However, to any one who knows sufficient of the working of the box to lift out the false bottom, it will be an easy matter to withdraw the springs and conceal them about his person. As you say, that is an easy matter, said Carne, and I shall not be likely to forget. Now, one other question. Presuming I am in a position to put the real box into your hands for, say, eight hours, do you think that in that time you can fit it up, so that detection will be impossible? Assuredly, my lord, replied Hiram Singh with conviction. There is but the lock and the fitting of the springs to be done. Three hours at most would suffice for that. I am pleased with you, said Carne. As a proof of my satisfaction, when the work is finished, you will each receive five hundred rupees. Now you can go. According to his promise, ten o'clock on the Friday following, found him in his hansom, driving towards Belgrave Square. He was a little anxious, though the casual observer would scarcely have been able to tell it. The magnitude of the stake for which he was playing was enough to try the nerve of even such a past master in his profession as Simon Carne. Arriving at the house, he discovered some workmen erecting an awning across the footway in preparation for the ball that was to take place at night. It was not long, however, before he found himself in the boudoir, reminding her grace of her promise to permit him an opportunity of making a drawing of the famous jewel case. The Duchess was naturally busy, and within a quarter of an hour he was on his way home, with the box placed on the seat of the carriage beside him. Now, he said as he patted it good-humouredly, if only the notion worked out by Hiram Singh and Wajib Baksh holds good, the famous Wiltshire diamonds will become my property before very many hours are passed. By this time tomorrow, I suppose, London will be all agog concerning the burglary. On reaching his house, he left his carriage and himself carried the box into his study. Once there, he rang his bell and ordered Hiram Singh and Wajib Baksh to be sent to him. When they arrived, he showed them the box upon which they were to exercise their ingenuity. "'Bring your tools in here,' he said, "'and do the work under my own eyes. You have but nine hours before you, so you must make the most of them.' The men went for their implements, and as soon as they were ready, set to work. All through the day they were kept hard at it, with the result that by five o'clock the alterations had been effected, and the case stood ready. By the time Carne returned from his afternoon drive in the park, it was quite prepared for the part it was to play in his scheme. Having praised the men, he turned them out and locked the door, then went across the room and unlocked a drawer in his writing table. From it he took a flat leather jewel case, which he opened. It contained a necklace of counterfeit diamonds, if anything a little larger than the one he intended to try to obtain. He had purchased it that morning in the Burlington Arcade for the purpose of testing the apparatus his servants had made, and this he now proceeded to do. Laying it carefully upon the bottom, he closed the lid and turned the key. 
when he opened it again the necklace was gone and even though he knew the secret he could not for the life of him see where the false bottom began and ended after that he reset the trap and tossed the necklace carelessly in to his delight it acted as well as on the previous occasion he could scarcely contain his satisfaction his conscience was sufficiently elastic to give him no trouble to him it was scarcely a robbery he was planning but an artistic trial of skill in which he pitted his wits and cunning against the forces of society in general at half-past seven he dined and afterwards smoked a meditative cigar over the evening paper in the billiard-room the invitations to the ball were for ten o'clock and at nine-thirty he went to his dressing-room make me tidy as quickly as you can he said to belton when the latter appeared and while you are doing so listen to my final instructions to-night as you know i am endeavouring to secure the duchess of wiltshire's necklace to-morrow all london will resound with the hubbub and i have been making my plans in such a way as to arrange that Klimo shall be the first person consulted when the messenger calls if call he does see that the old woman next door bids him tell the duke to come personally at twelve o'clock do you understand perfectly sir very good now give me the jewel case and let me be off you need not sit up for me precisely as the clocks in the neighbourhood were striking ten simon carne reached belgrave square and as he hoped found himself the first guest his hostess and her husband received him in the ante-room of the drawing-room i come laden with a thousand apologies he said as he took her grace's hand and bent over it with that ceremonious politeness which was one of the man's chief characteristics i am most unconscionably early i know but i hastened here in order that i might personally return the jewel-case you so kindly lent me i must trust to your generosity to forgive me the drawings took longer than i expected please do not apologize answered her grace it is very kind of you to have brought the case yourself i hope the illustrations have proved successful i shall look forward to seeing them as soon as they are ready but i am keeping you holding the box one of my servants will take it to my room she called a footman to her and bade him take the box and place it upon her dressing-table before it goes i must let you see that i have not damaged it either externally or internally said carne with a laugh it is such a valuable case that i should never forgive myself if it had even received a scratch during the time it has been in my possession so saying he lifted the lid and allowed her to look inside to all appearances it was exactly the same as when she had lent it to him earlier in the day you have been most careful she said and then with an air of banter she continued if you desire it i shall be pleased to give you a certificate to that effect they jested in this fashion for a few moments after the servant's departure during which time carne promised to call upon her the following morning at eleven o'clock and to bring with him the illustrations he had made and a queer little piece of china he had had the good fortune to pick up in a dealer's shop the previous afternoon by this time fashionable london was making its way up the grand staircase and with its appearance further conversation became impossible shortly after midnight carne bade his hostess good night and slipped away he was perfectly satisfied with his evening's entertainment and if the key of the jewel-case were not turned before the jewels were placed in it he was convinced they would become his property it speaks well for his strength of nerve when i record the fact that on going to bed his slumbers were as peaceful and untroubled as those of a little child breakfast was scarcely over next morning before a hansom drew up at his front door and lord amberley alighted he was ushered into carne's presence forthwith and on seeing that the latter was surprised at his early visit hastened to explain my dear fellow he said as he took possession of the chair the other offered him i have come round to see you on most important business as i told you last night at the dance when you so kindly asked me to come and see the steam yacht you have purchased i had an appointment with wiltshire at half-past nine this morning on reaching belgrave square i found the whole house in confusion servants were running hither and thither with scared faces the butler was on the borders of lunacy the duchess was well-nigh hysterical in her boudoir while her husband was in his study vowing vengeance against all the world you alarm me 
said Carne, lighting a cigarette with a hand that was as steady as a rock. What on earth has happened? I think I might safely allow you fifty guesses, and then wager a hundred pounds you'd not hit the mark. And yet, in a certain measure, it concerns you. Concerns me? Good gracious! What have I done to bring all this about? Pray do not look so alarmed, said Amberley. Personally, you have done nothing. Indeed, on second thoughts, I don't know that I am right in saying that it concerns you at all. The fact of the matter is, Carne, a burglary took place at Wiltshire House, and the famous necklace has disappeared. Good heavens, you don't say so. But I do. The circumstances of the case are as follows. When my cousin retired to her room last night after the ball, she unclasped the necklace, and in her husband's presence, placed it carefully in her jewel case, which she locked. That having been done, Wiltshire took the box to the room which contained the safe, and himself placed it there, locking the iron door with his own key. The room was occupied that night, according to custom, by the butler and one of the footmen, both of whom have been in the family since they were boys. Next morning after breakfast, the Duke unlocked the safe and took out the box, intending to convey it to the bank as usual. Before leaving, however, he placed it on his study table and went upstairs to speak to his wife. He cannot remember exactly how long he was absent, but he feels convinced that he was not gone more than a quarter of an hour at the very utmost. Their conversation finished, she accompanied him downstairs, where she saw him take up the case to carry it to his carriage. Before he left the house, however, she said, I suppose you have looked to see that the necklace is all right. How could I do so, was his reply. You know you possess the only key that will fit it. She felt in her pockets, but to her surprise, the key was not there. If I were a detective, I should say that that is a point to be remembered, said Carne with a smile. Pray, where did she find her keys? Upon her dressing table, said Amberley though she has not the slightest recollection of leaving them there. Well, when she had produced the keys, what happened? Why, they opened the box, and to their astonishment and dismay, found it empty. The jewels were gone. Good gracious, what a terrible loss. It seems almost impossible that it can be true. And pray, what did they do? At first they stood staring into the empty box, hardly believing the evidence of their own eyes. Stare how they would, however, they could not bring them back. The jewels had, without doubt, disappeared. But when and where the robbery had taken place, it was impossible to say. After that, they had up all the servants and questioned them, but the result was what they might have foreseen. No one, from the butler to the kitchen maid, could throw any light upon the subject. To this minute, it remains as great a mystery as when they first discovered it. I am more concerned than I can tell you, said Carne. How thankful I ought to be that I returned the case to her grace last night. But in thinking of myself, I am forgetting to ask what has brought you to me. If I can be of any assistance, I hope you will command me. Well, I'll tell you why I have come, replied Lord Amberley. Naturally, they are most anxious to have the mystery solved, and the jewels recovered as soon as possible. Wiltshire wanted to send to Scotland Yard there and then, but his wife and I eventually persuaded him to consult Klimo. As you know, if the police authorities are called in first, he refuses the business altogether. Now, we thought, as you are his next-door neighbour, you might possibly be able to assist us. You may be very sure, my lord, I will do everything that lies in my power. Let us go and see him at once. As he spoke, he rose and threw what remained of his cigarette into the fireplace. His visitor having imitated his example, they procured their hats and walked round from Park Lane into Belverton Street to bring up at number one. After they had rung the bell, the door was opened to them by the old woman who invariably received the detective's clients. "'Is Mr. Clemo at home?' asked Carne. "'And if so, can we see him?' The old lady was a little deaf, and the question had to be repeated before she could be made to understand what was wanted. As soon, however, as she realised their desire, she informed them that her master was absent from town, but would be back as usual at twelve o'clock to meet his clients. "'What on earth to be done?' said the Earl, looking at his companion in dismay. "'I'm afraid I can't come back again, as I have a most important appointment at that hour.' 
you think you could entrust the business to me? asked Carne. If so, I will make a point of seeing him at twelve o'clock, and could call at Wiltshire House afterwards and tell the Duke what I have done. That's very good of you, replied Amberley. If you are sure it would not put you to too much trouble, that would be quite the best thing to be done. I will do it with pleasure, Carne replied. I feel it my duty to help in whatever way I can. You are very kind, said the other. Then, as I understand it, you are to call up Climo at twelve o'clock, and afterwards let my cousins know what you have succeeded in doing. I only hope he will help us to secure the thief. We are having too many of these burglaries just now. I must catch this hansom and be off. Good-bye, and many thanks. Good-bye, said Carne, and shook him by the hand. The hansom having rolled away, Carne retraced his steps to his own abode. It is really very strange, he muttered as he walked along, how often chance condescends to lend her assistance to my little schemes. The mere fact that his grace left the box unwatched in his study for a quarter of an hour may serve to throw the police off on quite another scent. I am also glad that they decided to open the case in the house, for if it had gone to the bankers and had been placed in the strong room unexamined, I should never have been able to get possession of the jewels at all. Three hours later he drove to Wiltshire House, and saw the Duke. The Duchess was far too upset by the catastrophe to see anyone. "'This is really most kind of you, Mr. Carne," said His Grace, when the other had supplied an elaborate account of his interview with Climo. "'We are extremely indebted to you. I am sorry he cannot come before ten o'clock tonight, and that he makes this stipulation of my seeing him alone. For I must confess I should like to have had someone else present to ask any questions that might escape me. But if that's his usual hour and custom, well, we must abide by it, that's all. I hope he will do some good, for this is the greatest calamity that has ever befallen me. As I told you just now, it has made my wife quite ill. She is confined to her bedroom and quite hysterical. You do not suspect anyone, I suppose, inquired Karen. Not a soul, the other answered. The thing is such a mystery that we do not know what to think. I feel convinced, however, that my servants are as innocent as I am. Nothing will ever make me think them otherwise. I wish I could catch the fellow, that's all. I'd make him suffer for the trick he's played me. Carne offered an appropriate reply, and after a little further conversation upon the subject, bade the irate nobleman good-bye, and left the house. From Belgrave Square he drove to one of the clubs of which he had been elected a member, in search of Lord Orpington, with whom he had promised to lunch, and afterwards took him to a shipbuilder's yard near Greenwich, in order to show him the steam yacht he had lately purchased. It was close upon dinner-time before he returned to his own residence. He brought Lord Orpington with him, and they dined in state together. At nine o'clock the latter bade him good-bye, and at ten Carn retired to his dressing-room and rang for Belton. "'What have you to report?' he asked, with regard to what I bade you do in Belgrave Square." I followed your instructions to the letter, Belton replied. Yesterday morning I wrote to Messrs. Horniblow and Jinison, the house agents in Piccadilly, in the name of Colonel Braithwaite, and asked for an order to view the residence to the right of Wiltshire House. I asked that the order might be sent direct to the house, where the Colonel would get it upon his arrival. This letter I posted myself in Basingstoke, as you desired me to do. At nine o'clock yesterday morning I dressed myself as much like an elderly army officer as possible, and took a cab to Belgrave Square. The caretaker, an old fellow of close upon seventy years of age, admitted me immediately upon hearing my name, and proposed that he should show me over the house. This, however, I told him was quite unnecessary, backing my speech with a present of half a crown, whereupon he returned to his breakfast perfectly satisfied, while I wandered about the house at my own leisure. Reaching the same floor as that upon which is situated the room in which the Duke's safe is kept, I discovered that your supposition was quite correct, and that it would be possible for a man, by opening the window, to make his way along the coping from one house to the other, without being seen. I made certain that there was no one in the bedroom in which the butler slept, and then arranged the long telescope walking stick you gave me, and fixed one of my boots to it by means of the screw in the end. With this I was able to make a regular succession of footsteps in the dust along the ledge between one window and the other. That done, I went downstairs again, 
bade the caretaker good morning and got into my cab from belgrave square i drove to the shop of the pawnbroker whom you told me you had discovered was out of town his assistant inquired my business and was anxious to do what he could for me i told him however that i must see his master personally as it was about the sale of some diamonds i had had left me i pretended to be annoyed that he was not at home and muttered to myself so that the man could hear something about its meaning a journey to amsterdam then i limped out of the shop paid off my cab and walking down a by-street removed my moustache and altered my appearance by taking off my greatcoat and muffler a few streets further on i purchased a bowler hat in place of the old-fashioned topper i had hitherto been wearing and then took a cab from piccadilly and came home you have fulfilled my instructions admirably said carne and if the business comes off as i expect it will you shall receive your usual percentage now i must be turned into climo and be off to belgrave square to put his grace of wiltshire upon the track of this burglar before he retired to rest that night simon carne took something wrapped in a red silk handkerchief from the capacious pocket of the coat climo had been wearing a few moments before having unrolled the covering he held up to the light the magnificent necklace which for so many years had been the joy and pride of the ducal house of wiltshire the electric light played upon it and touched it with a thousand different hues where so many have failed he said to himself as he wrapped it in the handkerchief again and locked it in his safe it is pleasant to be able to congratulate oneself on having succeeded it is without its equal and i don't think i shall be overstepping the mark if i say that i think when she receives it liz will be glad she lent me the money next morning all london was astonished by the news that the famous wiltshire diamonds had been stolen and a few hours later carne learnt from an evening paper that the detectives who had taken up the case upon the supposed retirement from it of climo were still completely at fault that evening he was to entertain several friends to dinner they included lord amberley lord orpington and a prominent member of the privy council lord amberley arrived late but filled to overflowing with importance his friends noticed his state and questioned him well gentlemen he answered as he took up a commanding position upon the drawing-room hearthrug i am in a position to inform you that climo has reported upon the case and the upshot of it is that the wiltshire diamond mystery is a mystery no longer what do you mean asked the others in a chorus i mean that he sent in his report to wiltshire this afternoon as arranged from what he has said the other night after being alone in the room with the empty jewel case and a magnifying glass for two minutes or so he was in a position to describe the modus operandi and what is more to put the police on the scent of the burglar and how was it worked asked carne from the empty house next door replied the other on the morning of the burglary a man purporting to be a retired army officer called with an order to view got the caretaker out of the way clambered along to wiltshire house by means of the parapet outside reached the room during the time the servants were at breakfast opened the safe and abstracted the jewels but how did climo find all this out asked lord orpington by his own inimitable cleverness replied lord amberley at any rate it has been proved that he was correct the man did make his way from next door and the police have since discovered that an individual answering to the description given visited a pawnbroker's shop in the city about an hour later and stated that he had diamonds to sell if that is so it turns out to be a very simple mystery after all said lord orpington as they began their meal thanks to the ingenuity of the cleverest detective in the world remarked amberley in that case here's a good health to climo said the privy councillor raising his glass i will join you in that said simon carne here's a very good health to climo and his connection with the duchess of wiltshire's diamonds may he always be equally successful hear hear to that replied his guests end of section four end of chapter three